Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Kent City Council Committee of the Whole Meeting. Today is Tuesday, September 8th, 2020. And this is a remote meeting due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you are joining us live on Kent TV 21, we are also broadcasting on the City of Kent Facebook page, Kent TV 21 YouTube channel, and welcome to anyone that is calling into the meeting today. Kim, could you please call the roll? Council President Trotner? Here. Council Member Boyce? Here. Council Member Fincher? Here. Council Member Core? Here. Council Member Larmer? Here. Council Member Michaud? Here. Council Member Thomas? Thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any changes to the agenda from council or staff? None from staff this afternoon. Wonderful. Well, we will get going with our first presentation. I'd like to welcome Cheryl. Cheryl, you've got a couple things here. So let's start with South 224th Street Project Phase 2 Drainage Easement. All righty. Hi, everyone. I hope you all had a nice, uh, healthy summer. It's been a little while since I've talked to you. So today I'm going to talk about two things because I've been saving them up. Um, the first is um, the Doherty property acquisition. Um, this is for the South 224th Street project. And as you guys know, the first two phases of this project are open to traffic. And once this is completed, um, it'll connect the East Valley Highway and Benson Road. The project requires the city to acquire from Craig and Christine Doherty a drainage easement, access easement, temporary construction easement, and a portion of the Doherty's property in fee. Um, this property is located at 22011 76th Avenue South. Um, so just to explain a little bit more about this uh, acquisition, in January of 2018, the city and the Doherty's um, signed a possession and use a partial settlement agreement, and it granted city, the city possession of the area to be acquired in fee and the temporary construction easement area. So we could go on those and, and use them for the project. Um, under this agreement, the city made an initial payment uh, to the Doherty's uh, of $15,000. So that was under the um, partial settlement agreement. And that was with the understanding that the final agreement uh, regarding cash compensation and other outstanding issues would be negotiated as part of the final settlement agreement, which uh, I'm bringing to you here today. Um, so as part of this final settlement agreement, in addition to the um, items that were in the partial settlement agreement, uh, the city has agreed to correct a drainage issue that has occurred over time on the property. The Doherty signed the final settlement agreement accepting $40,000 total as the negotiated final compensation amount in exchange for granting the city a 4,886 square foot drainage easement, a 383 foot temporary construction easement, a 1,299 square foot access easement, and ownership of 1,619 square feet of their uh, property in fee uh, for right of way. So um, the entire budget impact for this is $40,000 and it's from the South 224th Street project budget. Um, so I, I don't know if anybody has any questions. The, the um, slide up there kind of shows the area for where each one of these easements in the fee area is. So um, if you have any questions, I'm ready Thanks, to hear. Cheryl. All right, thank you. Any questions for Cheryl about this um, presentation? All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, I'm very familiar with this area because I use that back road and it's it looks so great now that it's had that um, pavement overlay. It, it's really wonderful to drive on. Um, as long as there are no objections, we will move this forward for the mayor to sign and put it on the consent calendar. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, moving on. All right. Okay, the um, next property that um, we are asking to acquire is the Phillips property. Uh, the city of Kent has been working with the owner to purchase this property uh, located at 
26127 Southeast Kent Kangley Road, and this is in Ravensdale. Um, the city was preparing to contract, contact the property owner um, to advise that we needed to acquire the property. Um, and the owner actually at that point approached the city to let us know that they wanted to sell the property and wanted to know if we were interested. And so it was perfect timing. Uh, the city is going to uh, acquire the property, which has a single family resident um, with frontage along Rock Creek um, and consisting of 54,014 square feet for the fair market value of $540,000. Um, and this was established by the city's review appraiser. Uh, the property is going to be used for the protection and uh, preservation of the Rock Creek watershed. Uh, the reason for this acquisition, it's part of the city's Clark Springs Water Supply System Habitat Conservation Plan. And the city has uh, committed substantial resources towards the protection, enhancement, and restoration of the Rock Creek watershed. And this supplies water to the city's Clark Springs water source. The goal of this project is to create, enhance, and conserve valuable fish habitat in Rock Creek while supplying water to the city. So acquiring this property will allow the city to establish a conservation easement for the purpose of improving water quality and protecting salmon populations within Rock Creek. Um, so the budget impact for this one is $540,000 from the Clark Springs Habitat Conservation's measure budget. Um, it, I don't know if you have any questions, feel free to ask away. All right, any questions for Cheryl on this particular presentation? Okay, I am not seeing any hands raised. And as long as there are no objections, we will move this forward to the consent calendar as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, great. Cheryl. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Okay, moving on, I am going to welcome Bill Ellis to give us another small business grant update. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. And uh, Good afternoon, Council President and Council Members. Uh, I am here to give a new uh, CARES Act funds update on the Small Business Emergency Relief Grant. Um, Kim, if you could please advance to the first slide, I'll get started. Um, so I've been doing this all along, so I thought I'd keep with it. The timeline, where we are now, um, we have dispersed 98% of our selected uh, uh, applicants at this point, uh, there remains about five or half a dozen uh, uh, businesses that have been non-responsive uh, after being notified uh, on multiple occasions, many attempts made to connect with them um, that they had been selected. Um, we've been spending a lot of the time, or rather CRAP3 has over the last few weeks in working directly with um, those remaining couple dozen businesses uh, to make sure that they sign their grant agreements, apply the W-9 forms, do some of the CARES Act compliance uh, um, uh, record creation that uh, uh, was necessary for them to receive grants. But at this point today, uh, 211 businesses of the 217 selected have been funded uh, and money has been dispersed to them. Next slide, please. Just to recall, uh, here is our eligibility criteria. The application period is now closed. Uh, for those who might be watching or tuning in for the first time, uh, the text in red and strike through represents what the original eligibility criteria was for the first two weeks. Uh, and then we extended for an additional two weeks after uh, relaxing that criteria. Um, that was the criteria for eligibility. Next slide, please. Uh, we received 539 unique applications. Um, the organizations to your right uh, have some or had some role in the uh, uh, outreach in addition to our public communications uh, and direct emailing to businesses. Next slide, please. And we have some information that I'm sure uh, Council had interest in, in learning about, which is the demographics of the applicant pool. So the 539 that applied, about 45% were uh, women-owned businesses, less than 2.5% were veteran-owned. Uh, on the column on the left, you see preferred language that's not to say that uh, obviously business owners who said that that was their preferred language, Arabic, Punjabi, Russian, Somali, Spanish, Vietnamese, or others such as Korean, Ukrainian, Japanese, and Chinese, and Dari, uh, doesn't mean that those are the only languages spoken perhaps in their household, but it's the preferred language that they wanted to continue to do business uh, with the city on, or if they wanted to avail themselves to the technical assistance that we had on support for language barriers. 
Uh, the racial ethnicity uh, as self-reported by the businesses or attested to by the businesses, 26% uh, Asian, 20% Black or African American, 8.2% Latinx or Hispanic, uh, about 1% Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, 2% two, two or more races, 24.5% white, 2.5% other, about 2% chose not to disclose, and the remainder of the applicant pool, 12 to 13%, chose to leave this uh, field in the questions blank. Next slide, please. So we went from 539 applications uh, down to about 311 eligible. And of the 311 eligible, Craft 3 selected to the total amount of funds that we had available, less their fees, 217 grantees. As I mentioned earlier, uh, 211 disbursements are anticipated by close of business today, five are unresponsive. One of the reasons why I've been saying uh, when asked, you know, what is the final list of businesses? Well, the list isn't final. Uh, if we have to rescind, we uh, Craft 3 has to rescind uh, grant awards, they go further down the list of eligible awardees and uh, then let them know that they are eligible uh, and have been selected for grant funding. So it's been a bit of dynamic process still. Um, about 72% are uh, minority owned, 58% of those selected were women owned, about 3% veteran owned, uh, about 10% of them reported uh, jobs lost at their business. The average business revenue reported in 2019 by a selected business who received funding was $234,000. The average years in business uh, was 11, and the average household income uh, reported by the business owner was $77,000 a year. Um, glancing at the applicant list, I think about 37 of the businesses were child or daycares, which was a very large percentage. Next slide, please. Madam Chair. Yes, Council Member. Uh, I have a question for Bill, if you don't mind, please. Please. Could you go back to the previous slide, Bill, please? Yes. So you got 216 versus 217. Is one missing somewhere or what? Your grant award is 217. Yeah, I, that's correct. Uh, as I put there, 211 by close of business, five are unresponsive. One, I think they did hear from today, and I should have put that in. That's okay. uh, I don't have a final report. I did talk to Craft uh, 3 at noon to get these numbers updated. Um, I saw a question also in the, in the chat box here from Brenda Fincher, uh, Councilmember Fincher. It's about 17% of daycares. Um, regarding the, uh, yeah, it, there is a discrepancy of one there, but I think it's because the business in that case had at least filed the W-9, but it was incomplete, which isn't sufficient, you know, at this stage to, to say, well, we're just going to rescind at that point. They're just working with them to make sure there's technical troubleshooting questions are answered. Uh, five, had, there are five that they've decided to um, decide that those businesses are simply non-responsive and to move further down the list. Well, is it, is it too late for those five now? Have they, did they miss the cutoff, Bill, the five? Yeah, the, those five, yeah. They, they, were, they applied. Mm -hmm. They were deemed eligible. They went through a scoring system. They were selected. Uh, they have been communicated to by Craft 3 on many, many, many occasions through all forms of contact that they've provided and others. Mm -hmm. And if they still do not respond, even in part, then they make the decision to rescind. Okay. But my question is, is, is it too late for them to still be part of this process or did they miss out already? The five? They miss out. Okay. Because there are others who are, uh, between the 217 and the 311 who are eligible, there's others then who are deemed worthy, who are eligible, um, that rise in priority as potentially responsive. You know, extraordinary efforts were made over a period of weeks and then yep. at some point move further down the list. That's this explains the discrepancy between 211, the five unresponsive and the 217 is there's probably one other business that is in communication, but probably won't get their disbursement today, but they're yeah, at least response. That makes sense. Are we going to leave any dollars on the table because of five did not, I'm sure we had an allocation. No, we, we, uh, no, because we have, if you uh, recall, we went from 539 applications down to 311 that are eligible. That means you still have 95 businesses then if you take these five out down to 90 businesses that are still uh, eligible, um, okay. that they're scored. We just didn't have sufficient funding to reach that far, you know, to number 91, right? Okay. So, so we start going down that list, which is the next slide actually. Thank you, sir. Yep, you're welcome. So the next slide, remaining eligible applicants. 
So, uh, you know, 95, you subtract the five that are going to get rescinded. Once you're rescinded, you're, you're done. Uh, there's 90 remaining applications. As I said, 217 selected for funding so far. Uh, what I'm informing council of today is that uh, uh, since the Department of Commerce is now adding to its CARES Act funding to the city of Kent, uh, we are looking to allocate an additional $617,500 to this relief effort, which would fund those 90 remaining eligible applicants. Um, and there's a flat fee charged as well uh, for Craft 3, which is $16,625, which is a roughly $175 for Craft 3 for all the technical troubleshooting work, the ACH fees, um, making the payments, making those disbursements, record retention, working with those businesses. Overall, considering that uh, uh, we are distributing to over $2.1 million uh, with this additional funding uh, to the business community, Craft 3's fees of about $105,000 or 5% seems uh, very, very reasonable and reflects their, their mission as an organization, as a nonprofit, uh, and their uh, work to keep their costs at cost uh, and not pursue this as profit. Uh, we estimate if uh, we sign this contract edition uh, tomorrow, uh, it'll take another two to three weeks to, remit, to fund and disperse those remaining 90 eligible applications. Um, any questions at, at this, on this slide before I move on? Great news, Bill. Thank you so much for sharing this today. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So returning to those who, um, so between the 539 to the 312, what, why was it that they were deemed ineligible? This isn't exhaustive of all the reasons why they're deemed ineligible. These are the most prevalent reasons given. Uh, 91 failed the test of not having an owner, officer, partner, or principal actor of the business who is currently employed by the city of Kent or is an immediate family member. That includes spouse or sibling, but it also uh, referenced the entire um, list of uh, familial relationships that are in our HR policy. Uh, 67 failed the test, have been in business for at least two years. Uh, 47 failed the test of having no more than 15 full-time employees, and 46 failed the test of our uh, own finance department checking on business licensing uh, on whether they were delinquent in any previous taxes or fees owed to the city prior to the COVID-19 uh, uh, catastrophe uh, in December 31st, 2019. So uh, that explains uh, the primary reasons why businesses were deemed ineligible. Uh, at this point, though, with this additional funding, we should be able to fund all of those eligible under our criteria, uh, all 311 minus the five that we're going to likely have to rescind due to non-responsiveness after the selection of those. And with that, I'll take additional questions. All right, any questions for Bill? All right, so Bill, if, when can we possibly, you said two to three weeks? that they'll be able to yeah, start working through this process? Yeah, they're going to, um, uh, once we've uh, inked the contract amendment following council today, we have a, a amendment ready to go for tomorrow. Uh, it'll take a couple of days to then uh, have that uh, countersigned and then uh, be able to wire more money to Craft 3. Uh, at that point, Craft 3 will be in contact with those eligible businesses and asking them, you know, how soon or how long could they wait only as they try to stagger out their work and try to do in waves of disbursements, those remaining 90 uh, applicants. Craft 3 is uh, taking on some additional granting work from other agencies at this point. And is uh, because we've only learned of this last Wednesday of this additional funding opportunity, uh, moving uh, people around uh, to uh, be on hand staff and work through those issues. Uh, our experience so far is that, you know, 80% of the businesses uh, uh, send their paperwork in right away uh, the remaining 20% have a variety of issues, whether it's uh, trying to do PDF, um, uh, filling out of forms, uh, there might be a language barrier, in which case the city is prepared to bring in technical assistance on language issues, um, a variety of things that could um, delay, uh, but we try to keep those delays um, not as a result of anything the city or our agents can do. Um, so uh, at that point, it should take about two to three weeks um, and uh, the only five that uh, are not are being rescinded is because complete complete non uh, non responsiveness. Uh, we're led to speculate that the business might have closed, and those those five unfortunate instances 
Um, but the vast majority, uh, we, we, we spend the time and make sure that we get through uh, the challenges that might exist with attesting to how they're going to spare under CARES Act compliance rules uh, that we work through and technically uh, do the troubleshooting around online submission and uh, um, do whatever else is necessary in terms of providing assistance and making sure that those selected get dispersed. Um, again, our approach to all of this has been a bit of a triage and we have uh, tried to prioritize um, those that we felt uh, either for historical reasons or from current reporting would be most vulnerable to the impacts of the COVID-19 closures, either from being low income or from a historically underrepresented group. Well, and again, I just want to say thank you for making sure that, you know, now our entire small business community is going to benefit from this um, because of the extra funds. So um, I do have uh, Council Member Fincher has a question or comment. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Council President. Bill, all of the ones who failed because they did not have a current business license with the city yeah. of Kent, were they offered the opportunity to, to register and yeah. get a license with the city? During the four weeks uh, up until uh, the closure, we uh, made it known that even if you didn't have a license up until that point, you still could up until the very last day of uh, Friday before the weekend it was due. Uh, and we made extraordinary efforts on that account. Uh, we also did not charge them, uh, but, you know, we charged them at a pro rate level to get their uh, business license and we did not look for back, you know, back dues on the business license. Um, and we did get dozens subscribed. I can't correlate for you right now how many additional business licenses that came in in those last four weeks as reported from our finance department. We saw a bit of an increase or very significant increase. How many of them uh, correspond to the list that eventually got uh, uh, selected in funds? But there were other folks and you know, I'll, I'll point here, um, lumped in with the uh, business license there is also the delinquent in payment of taxes or fees. So there was a couple of different things in the 46 that failed that test. It's, it's not all down or attributable to business license. That's kind of clumped together on that slide. Yes, thank you very much. Yep. All right, any other questions or comments? All right, I think Derek, did you wanna add something to this before we move on? Yes, thank you, Madam President. So Bill alluded to it a couple of times, but wanted to share officially that uh, the state is increasing the size of our CARES grant. Um, it was previously um, roughly 3.9 million. It will go to about 5.8 million. And instead of having to spend the funds by the end of October, we'll have until the end of November. So we're working with the state to amend the interlocal agreement and expect to bring that to council. At that point, we'll provide you with a report on all of the uses of the CARES funding, but you're very familiar with the two largest. Um, with the additions that Bill talked about today, we'll be over $2 million in small business granting. Um, you're familiar with the um, laptop purchase. Um, and then we're working on reimbursing expenses and also looking into a, a possibility of utility assistance. And then of course, above and beyond the CARES grant is close to a million dollars in CDBG coronavirus funds, which are um, focused on our nonprofit community. So we'll expect to uh, provide a uh, thorough report on that at an upcoming committee meeting. Great, looking forward to that. Um, so if there's no other questions, that was information only, but I'm sure all of my colleagues would agree that um, we, we support these efforts. So thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Council President. All right, moving on. Michelle, would you like to talk about July financials? Tony, you're breaking up, Tony. Oh, is that better? I'd like to welcome Michelle to talk about the J July financial report. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All righty. Okay, so I'm Michelle Ferguson, the financial planning manager with the city of Kent presenting the July 2020 monthly financial report. So first off, was, we'll talk about the general fund. Uh, we have received nearly 59 million in revenues through July. Revenues through July of 2019 were slightly over $64 million, which is about a $5 million difference. Our revenues are down in every category with the exception of property taxes and utility taxes. The revenues estimated 
to see the greatest percent of unfavorable, var unfavorable variances are taxes, charges for services, and miscellaneous revenues. And in the next two slides, we'll go into a little more detail on the revenue variances. So here you can see the uh, property taxes have been coming in slightly over budget, and we're going to estimate that these revenues will come in about $700,000 over budget. So the sales tax revenues have been coming in strong thanks to um, strong internet sales. Um, but as you can see here that the uh, sales tax looks off for July. So uh, if you remember during the council mini retreat last month, finance director Paula Painter talked about the annexation credit ending last month and the, or in June and the accrual entries that need to be done to complete the annexation revenues. So sales tax revenues run on a two month lag at the end of the year, the revenues that are received in January and February are accrued back to November and December. And since these annexation revenues have ended, there are no revenues that are gonna be accrued back to 2020 and 2021. So uh, what we've done is removed those revenues from the books that we've still gotten them, but it's kind of an accounting entry where we remove the revenues in January and February. So we still have them, but this accounting wise, it makes it look a little bit off, but we just did that. So at the end of the year, you're not, it's not looking like sales tax is coming in super strong. And then all of a sudden we get hit with this big um, decrease because of the accruals. So we just wanted to do it now and be done with it. So on the next slide, um, you can see utility tax uh, is coming in overall, just slightly over budget, um, about 167,000 over the 2019 year to date revenues, but it is a little bit lower for July than expected. Uh, b &O tax is 1.1 million over the 2019 year to date revenues. Um, and this is due to the increase in square footage rates. Uh, other revenues include licenses and permits under governmental revenue, charges for services and miscellaneous revenues. So the licenses and permits are down about 780,000 from the same time last year. And our governmental revenues are down slightly over 2.2 million from last year, which is mostly due to the revenues for SST mitigation moving to the Capital Resources Fund. Charges for services are also down a little bit over $2.2 million, which is a combination of charges for services from parks, ECD, fire, and a small amount from court. Miscellaneous revenues are down 524,000, which can be attributed to less revenues coming in for the senior center, rentals, and things like that. So if we move on to the next slide, um, the general fund expenditures, um, I didn't highlight any this time because you can see that most of them um, have a, a negative variance, which is good. So overall, the general fund expenditures are almost 1.9 million over what they were in 2019 at this point in time. But if you remember in the last month's report, it was $2.7 million difference. So you can see that, um, that that variance is getting lower and lower as each month goes on. And as you can see, most of the departments are coming in under budget. Um, with the year half gone, you would expect to see roughly 58% of the budget expended, but it's under 50%. So everybody um, is spending less as well as the cuts that have gone through. So as uh, this variance will continue to decrease as the year goes on due to the central cost, as cost allocation plan and the COVID cuts. Madam Chair. Yes, Council Member Boyce. Thank you. Could you explain to me the intergovernment revenue again? It's like 0.53. I get confused with it every time. I was hoping you could explain it to me, please. The intergovernmental revenue are um, things that we get from um, uh, other places like other cities, like we get uh, money from uh, Maple Valley and from uh, Federal Way for using our jail services. And we used to get money from the state for the SST revenues. So it's anything that comes from another uh, government agency. So grants and things like that. So that's off a little bit. That's 53 seem awfully high. And that's pretty much what you think. You so that, that one we moved um, the SST money to the Capital Resources Fund and that was over $3 million. So um, that, that's why it's right. off that much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so month to month comparison for the different funds. Uh, you can see here the Capital Resources Fund is showing a negative variance for expenditures 
And due to the temporary pause in construction activities from COVID-19, there hasn't been a need to transfer as much funding to individual projects. So the funds remain in the capital resources fund and are invested until they're needed so we can get more money from the investment pool. But by the end of the year, this variance will be corrected and will be closer to a 25% positive variance. The criminal justice fund revenues um, have a higher variance than normal, and that can be attributed to the red light, red light camera fund revenues that we weren't receiving at this time last year. Uh, through July, the red light camera revenues have brought in nearly $1.3 million. Um, on the other hand, the school zone rev camera revenues have been, were coming in strong at the beginning of the year, but due to COVID, there's no school, so the cameras aren't on. Um, and the revenues are only about $537,000 year to date, um, which is about $400,000 less than the 2019 year to date revenues for those cameras. Uh, next slide, uh, you can see here that the fleet fund has a negative variance on the revenues and this is because of a large transfer into the fund in 2019. So in 2018, the new fuel island was originally budgeted to be paid out of the fleet fund, but in 2019 it was decided that the capital resource fund would pay for the project instead, and so the, the revenues, um, those funds were transferred back into the fleet fund of $1.75 million. So 2019 was just a little bit of an anomaly if you compare 2018 to 2020, it's right on target. And the central services budget has a negative variance for both revenues and expenditures. And the reduced revenues and expenditures can be attributed to departments spending less money for postage and office supplies. So overall the fund is fine because they balance out each other. And the last slide, um, just wanted to point out the unemployment fund. So it, it's showing a negative variance from 2019 to 2020. And this is deceiving because we've received the bill from the state for the second quarter, and uh, which was paid in August. And that is coming in more expensive than normal. Uh, and overall, the fund is likely to be 60 to $80,000 over budget at the end of the year due to all of the unemployment claims. So we will be doing a budget change closer to the end of the year around November, once we know what the third quarter expense will be. Are there any questions? Questions, Council Member Boyce. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Michelle, I, I know this is kind of hard to compare and thing that's kind of off through the COVID, but there are anything that's sticking out to you based on what you have seen that we should be concerned about? Um, expenditure wise, no, everything's looking pretty good. It's more, you know, the revenues for the, you know, charges for services, um, okay. and things like that. Um, but those can't be helped and they just got to hope that things get back on track as soon as possible. Um, but we have, you know, we, we know those going into the 21, 22 budgets and we've kind of adjusted as with the best information that we have right now in hopes that, um, in the new year, things will be better. We're probably expecting third quarter a little worse than this year, probably would be the right thing to say, you think? Um, they've been, uh, uh, the revenues have been coming in pretty steady the last couple of months, um, you know, month to month. There hasn't been like a big dip from one month to the next. So I'm hoping that August is the same and it's, we're almost ready to close and um, sales tax did fine, but I don't, I haven't been able to see the other revenues yet because they haven't been posted. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you, Councilmember Boyce. Any other questions or comments for Michelle? All right. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. All right. Looking at the agenda, the next thing we have is payment of bills, um, which everyone receives a copy of that. So we will move that to the consent calendar. And then Paula is going to talk about the ordinance to extend the square footage component of the city's b &O tax. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council President Troutner, members of City Council, and Mayor Ralph. Um, this morning or this afternoon, I'm in coming in front of you, or at least virtually coming to you with um, an ordinance that would extend the square footage component of our current b &O tax system. Um, the proposed amendment to this square footage um, component would become effective January 1, 2021, um, 
the purpose of this primarily is to does, um, provide equity amongst our taxpayers for those that are conducting warehousing activity, whether those activities are happening inside the confines of four walls or if they're happening outside of the walls. Currently, our B&O tax is comprised of two components, the gross receipts component, as well as the square footage, and businesses would pay the higher of the two. What this new component um, is, the well, excuse me, the purpose of the square footage component of our B&O tax system was really put into place to ensure that we were equi equitably taxing our businesses based on their physical size and the use of their buildings. However, what we've de determined is that there's still inequity in the square footage area. And that equity is, um, the result of that is that there's a component of it where we have people who are operating warehousing activities, not only within the walls of a facility, which is uh, subject to the square footage tax, but also in um, an outdoor setting. And currently that is not being subject to tax. And no matter um, which runs true, whether they're working within the four walls of a building or they're having these activities outside in a, in a commercial yard, the city still needs to re, uh, provide the same level of services and amenities. So what this proposed ordinance does is amends the square footage tax to um, ensure that all warehousing activities are being taxed, whether that's within the four walls or outside of that four walls. And this would include transloading of goods uh, between vehicles. Um, they, the tax rate would be the same for square footage. Um, in fact, this ordinance doesn't even touch that square footage tax um, rate that's currently in our system. It just extends it to um, outdoor storage or outdoor warehousing. Um, the ordinance also provides for a six acre threshold at which point the property which is being used for warehousing activities would be subject to that outdoor storage or out, excuse me, outdoor square footage tax rate. The areas that are outdoors that are not being used for warehousing activities will remain untaxed. Um, the, the city worked to um, do an extensive amount of outreach to the potentially impacted businesses. So what this looked like is two letters were sent out. One was sent out in the middle of May, and then the other was sent out in at the end of June. And these went out to businesses who could potentially be impacted by this proposed change. The purpose of the letter is to at least explain the nature of the change and our reasoning behind the pro proposed change. But most importantly, it was to invite these businesses to reach out to the city, um, schedule an opportunity to meet with us so that we can have a conversation about what kind of impact that this might have on them and, and also the reasoning behind doing this. Um, I know that you guys have a packet in front of you and what you're going to find missing from this packet is information about the businesses that we reached out to and the reason for that is due to the confidentiality requirements that's established within our city code. So we're not able to share down uh, to the business level with you guys, but we at least wanted to let you know that we did take the time to reach out to businesses um, who could potentially be impacted and to engage with them in a conversation. It's estimated that um, this could generate about $2.1 million in the B&O square footage tax revenue. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you, Paula. Any questions from council members? Council, uh, council member Michaud. Thank you, council president. Thanks for the presentation, Paula. I'm wondering what, how we came about the um, six acre area. Okay. 
case, the, so with the six acres, there was it was designed to to create a threshold, much like our warehousing. We don't we have a threshold related to our warehousing as well, because what we don't want to do is to really go after and tax other people for this for these smaller areas. We're really looking at area um, businesses that are taking up a large amount of area to be able to do this warehousing. Um, uh, activity. Thank you, Paula. Did that hopefully that answered your question, um, Sandria. Um, Council Member Boyce, I see you have your mic off. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. A uh, couple of questions. Paula, what was the total dollar amount again you said that they would generate? It would generate about $2.1 million in revenue. I know you can't identify the business. How many business are going to be impacted by this year, roughly? Can you give me a number? Yeah, I'll give you a ballpark. I mean, we've sent out more than a half a dozen letters. In the end, I think that we're, we're in the ballpark of about a half a dozen businesses that would be impacted. No, we... these, are larger, these are larger businesses. Uh -huh. they, Aren't the little mom and pop shops. Well, I know what you're talking about. I know the business you're talking about. I'm just, did we, you send the letters out twice. Did we hear back from all of the business? Um, no, we did not hear back from all of the businesses, um, which that is pro why we prompted the second letter, trying to encourage them to reach out to us. We have heard back from some, there's been some where they've um, scheduled meetings and then at the last minute have canceled them. Um, so, but we have been in communications with some of them. So the one that we have not heard from, um, is there anything else we could do to be proactive to make sure that they are getting the message? I would hate with December come and then we as council get lots of letters and say they're surprised. I'm asking from a city perspective, and they send out letters, which is good. Is there anything else we could do to make sure that the message is out there in a timely manner? Um, I am very happy to go back and look at any other communication that we might be able to have with the businesses. If the letters aren't working, I can um, work with administration to see if we can come up with another plan to be able to reach out to them. Well, you only have a, just a very small set of people that we are going after, right? Not going after, I mean, making sure they pay their fair share. Probably right yeah. the, uh, I just want to make sure that, you know, I know emails and, and letters and all that stuff, but, uh, you know, just and maybe this is the right way. And uh, I'm just asking the question. And if you say, Bill, this is what you know, yeah. okay. Hi, uh, Council Member Boyce, this is uh, Bill Ellis, the Economic Development Officer. My name is in all the letters, uh, and I did field some of the calls from the businesses. Okay. My impression is that some of these businesses, they're, 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 they're national businesses or international businesses. And, uh, it's very difficult to find a different a local contact, although we've we've attempted to, and uh, we've sent messages out. Um, and I heard, for instance, from behalf of one large business, from a, a person within that company in the state of Alabama, um, you know, and from others, it, it, they've they've messaged it around, um, but there's not a, a immediately obvious uh, way of getting a hold of some of these large international conglomerates beyond the contact information that we have and the efforts that we've made to write them letters. Uh, for the local folks or the ones that I we did hear from and uh, have already communicated with, but I'm not getting to the names of the businesses for the reasons that um, Paula mentioned. And just a thank you, Bill. Appreciate that. So just a follow-up question, please. So the one that you have communicated with, I mean, was a conversation well, they understand why we're doing what we're doing or were they totally resistant or can you share some of that please? Yeah, um, in the case of at least one business, um, they were no longer in Kent, uh, had left a few months ago. Uh, in the case of another, um, didn't have a lot of interest in having another meeting. And in the case of a third business, made a meeting uh, and then uh, canceled that meeting and uh, has not responded since. One other business that we spoke to, uh, both sides immediately understood that this tax in no way applied to them and their operations. Okay, so it's a large dollar amount, I would think it's business. If I want to know business, I want to at least have some conversation, but I mean, I get it, so. 
All right. Thank you, sir. And thank you also, Paula. Yeah, you're thank welcome. you. Uh, Council Member Michaud, did you have additional questions? Yes, thank you, Council President. So in the ordinance, it says that this money is um, intended to be used for transportation infrastructure. Can you tell me why that is? Yeah, so right now, the way that our B&O tax is established currently, our square footage tax, there, um, a big majority of that square footage tax does go to transportation infrastructure. So this is just a continuation. We haven't changed, again, our, our um, um, square footage tax. This is a square footage tax. It's just an extension of it. So what you're finding is that's just how the original ordinance was written. Thanks, Paula. Thanks, Paula. So then just to clarify, these particular businesses don't pay any B&O to the city. And this also does not affect any current businesses, the structure that they use for paying B&O, correct? So some of the businesses do pay B&O tax. Um, however, this would then, um, they would pay either the bigger of the B&O tax or the square footage tax. Um, some of them are not paying B&O tax at this time. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions for Paula on this particular topic? Madam Chair. Yes, Councilmember Boyce. So I think your question was, I'd like to follow up on your question, please. So I think what Paula would say, there's some who are paying the B&O tax and this here could cost them to pay more based on this here. That's what I heard, Paula. That is correct. So what it would be is you have to pay the, the larger of gross receipts or square footage. So they wouldn't have to pay for the um, square footage amount versus the gross receipts. Most, some of them don't pay any tax at all. Well, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about those. I mean, they should pay. I'm more concerned about the one that is paying today and uh, based on this here formula, they gonna they may have to pay more, right? That is correct. And what, what it is, is that the B&O tax that they're paying is very small for the amount of business that they're doing. So what this is doing is putting them more in line with the amount of, of um, services or the amount of land that they take up and um, the amount of uh, services required by the city for the business that they do just puts them more in line for that. And that makes sense. I mean, from a council perspective, right? So if I got a company ABC and I'm paying X amount of dollars a day based on where things are set up today, right? So we come in with this new square footage, right? So nothing really changed about my ABC company, except for the fact you say, well, based on your square footage bill, you're gonna have to pay more. So the company that falls in that category, I mean, how many falls in that category do you know? that will have to pay more than what they're paying today? Do we know how many? Councilmember Boyce, this is Bill Elf, the uh, Economic Development Officer. I think it would be roughly the same number of letters that we had sent out. Um, again, I think the observation here is there's very intensive land uses that uh, are doing operations attendant to their business license, like transloading and cross docking out of doors that are very intensive of resources, but because it takes place of out of doors and not within the confines of a warehouse, uh, it avoids taxation. And uh, depending on the size of those operations, um, really seems uh, it was a tax fairness issue that we were trying to communicate. You know, I get the purpose. You know, I guess what I'm getting at, just the communication of it, right? And I know we said we sent letters out and all this stuff there. And I guess Madam Mayor and, and Derek, you know, I mean, if those companies are local, they're right in Kent. I mean, I don't know why can't we make it a little more personal to make sure the information is out, right? I mean, I'm all about the communication piece. I understand why we're doing what we're doing. I support what we're doing, uh, but I just, I, I'm not getting a good feeling around the communication piece. Madam so Mayor. council member Boyce, um, I, I absolutely 100% hear you and agree. I do, um, we can give it one more round. 
Um, I will tell you, I know that we have made multiple attempts with the companies, especially the ones that are local. The majority of these companies, like a significant majority, are that that multinational, international, large corporation or other business. Um, and I think that's where the roadblocks are running into. I know that you know we we reached out to one company, um, or and then they reached out back to us. There was some some conversation, and and they didn't meet the standards. So that work has been done on a whole variety of levels. I think maybe we're not articulating it as clearly as you would like, but I I'm confident in the fact that we've made multiple attempts in various forms to reach all of these businesses. Okay, I'm um, I'm okay then. Based on what you just told me, Madam Mayor, then you uh, I'm at ease. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for clarifying. Um, all right. Any other questions for Paula, or for for Bill Ellis? Uh, okay. Madam President, um, yes. I wanted to follow up on Council Member Michaud's question about the use of the funds. Um, because I think she was referring to a section of the ordinance that actually was set forth but isn't being amended. So I think it's important to point out that nothing here in this ordinance changes how um, our B&O tax is allocated. It increases the amount of money that's coming in and that's allocated between transportation and um, capital budget, but the new funds don't exclusively go to transportation. It, it's a mix of transportation and capital and um, generally, which includes parks projects. Good point, thank you. All right, so before us, we have um, a motion to adopt the ordinance um, that, um, extends the square footage component of the BNO tax. So after this conversation, sounds like council member Boyce, you're okay. Any objections with moving this to the consent calendar? All right, I don't see any mics off or hands raised. So um, we will go ahead and move that forward to the consent calendar. Thank you so much for um, all those clarifying questions and great discussion. Looking at the agenda, and thank you, Paula, for joining us. Thank Looking you. at the agenda, we have come to um, the end. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Um, great conversations, and um, everyone stay safe, take care of yourself, enjoy this last bit of sunshine, and we are adjourned. <laughs>